in the case of Ghana, private sector led. Government was not aware, government was not interested, um, and so the private sector took it up. But the private sector we're discussing is me. I'm not exactly private sector, I'm academic. Only I did this job through the private sector. Yeah. Meaning that I realized that uh, you can wait for the university forever because they depend on government. And you can wait for the government forever, they have no clue. So I actually have been known to have said publicly that I cannot wait for the government to do it for the country. So I know how to do it. I will do it, no matter how small it is, just to make the point that we are able to do it. In so doing, maybe I can create an avalanche that will carry through the momentum. And that is what I try to do in, in the case of Ghana. Now, on the continent as a whole, there are variety. Like um, in the case of Egypt, where the, the minister there happens to be one of our counterparts from the Internet Society, ISOC, and that's Tarek Kamel. And so there was a heavy government success uh, built. In other places, uh, like South Africa, there was a good academic dose. So it has varied depending on, on, on the circumstances. But I think in much of West Africa, the thrust had been principally from private sector. Because I also went around helping Togo, private sector, helping Gambia, private sector, and so even Nigeria, giving them intellectual property so they could also begin to do it. So it became private sector helping private sector, but for the common good, because we really felt that we had to go together. Otherwise, things would just dis disappear. I allowed some countries to transit their data through me, and Togo was an example. But in other places, I actually sent engineers to go and install uh, nodes for them, and Gambia was an example. In other cases, I actually trained people like Swaziland. They brought uh, the telco people to me to be trained. In other cases, uh, we did consulting services to help Ethiopia and so on and so forth. So that was roughly the progression in that uh, the names had to come first, because that was meaningful, and we had to move mail, and so we had to do that. And then the next bit was get the capacities connected. And that one was a mad rush, but it was a good community activity in the sense that we, we wanted to help each other. And that has continued till now, because now I actually run the African Network Operators Group. And the principal function of this group um, is to sort of help operators support themselves. And usually we support ourselves with building our capacity in many different areas, mostly in uh, infrastructure related things like um, routing type of issues or server services type of issues for those who want to build information resources. Uh, the AFNOG has now become the meeting place for most of the technical community and we meet only once a year and when we meet it's like for a period of two weeks within which we spend one week to train whoever has been admitted into the into the workshops and we run four workshops in parallel now it didn't start as four, it started as just two, and then we've added as we went along. We even have a French track in the, in the routing side of things. Um, and when we meet after the workshops for the students, then we try to in, sort of induct the students into what the real world is. So we follow the workshop with meetings. And the meetings include the lots of parallel sessions. Uh, those who are following the Afrinic meetings uh, will get to do that. Those who may be discussing some tutorials, maybe in security, uh, will also get to do that. And then we also have a day for like conference presentations of 20, 30 minutes from a variety of different areas. And so that has now become a major meeting place for the engineers. And um, once a year, we all congregate. And it's supposed to be service to community type of thing in that nobody gets paid. But we try to raise money for the student participants to come. And we've been getting funding. Cisco has been a regular funding source. Uh, we got funding from IDRC, Internet Society, uh, Francophonie, and a whole number of others. But over time, we're trying to change our program so that we become more self-sustaining. So participants who are coming in from, uh, let's say, operators, telcos, and so on, we insist that they pay more their way so that we can raise funding for academic and research people to participate and so on. And that was really how, how things are. And it still continues to be a major meeting point 
uh, for, for many of our operators. Of course, once we've got the connectivity in, then there's a whole host of other issues that began to show up, uh, but we thought all of them can be solved within the same environment. So you have you know, CCTLD issues, oh, you have AFTLD. Let AFTLD focus that. Uh, you have the research and educational network challenge. Oh, build a consensus around the same meeting place. So to an extent, AFNOG has moved from being a workshop type of thing to a meeting place where many new things could be incubated and then allowed to blossom and take on their own life. Now, the particular case about the NIC was interesting in that we it took us 10 years to get to accreditation. Of course, in the beginning, we actually didn't know what it was. We knew it was very important. And for engineers, we knew that that was what to focus on, none of the other things. So we began to build consensus around it. We, you know, a proposal was made first in 95, then 97, a formal document, and then uh, we moved on. But we realized that we had to build something more than just casual meeting. And so we went to deliberately to Cotton to agree on specifics. And the specifics was who becomes a member of the board. And we decided to do it geographically, okay, so that we don't get too much caught into why is that there are so many people from the north and nobody from the south. So we say, okay, each one of the sub regions gets to elect one person. So it's the members who will elect that person, and that person will serve for a period of one to three years, depending on the staggering. And that is how that one also came. But the, the difficult thing with that was as we were learning, that meant more and more people were coming. So when, whenever we thought we had an agreement on something, we we're about to move forward like incorporation, then more people would come. One case was very disturbing, and, and that's a, sort of a moment. And that one, John Costello was also there. This was very early. And he had agreed that, me, just do it. We have to do it. It has to happen. So I invited them all to a meeting with the African engineers and everything. And suddenly somebody got up and said, no, 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 no. Why don't we share it up into the countries and have this all go our separate ways? And I mean, at that point, I thought that was the end of the world. And to be honest with you, I've never felt so ashamed because um, I was a bit of an interface between the African technical community and the global community. I knew John Postel myself personally. And they've come to sort of help me. But my people were not ready. So all John could say to me was, get your people ready, and you will have it. So I had to continue until I was able to uh, build sufficient consensus, and in 2005, we got it. And at that point, it was also evident that if it has taken so long, there are maybe two factors I have to consider. In 10 years, I would have upset a lot of people. And this could be real in the sense that the regist three registries had to give up something for affinity to exist. So it's inevitable that I would have made a number of people in those three registries uncomfortable. So for me, it was obvious I could not continue in the same capacity. Of course, I didn't tell my colleagues that this was my real feeling. But it was also true that um, if I were to stay there, I'll get less participation. I'll have less motivation for people to you know, make an effort. And what I needed more was more people making effort than just one person driving things. Because I knew that the space was so large that even if I had nothing to do with these things, there was plenty for me to do. So the strategic thinking was um, find a way to exit without telling anybody. Make sure you don't give out too much information for people to capitalize and game on it. So everybody thought I was indeed going to be the next official chair, not the you know startup chair, but the official chair. And I let them think so. But when it came to the board meeting, I decided to dissolve the board, and I got vote for it. Um, and then I decided I would not run again. And at the same time, certain people who had been um, 
you might say, uh, controversial in their contribution, I try to urge them not to. And in some cases, I even told them that if you try, I would marshal the community to vote you out. And in some cases, they tried and they were voted out. Uh, but that created a certain flow of uh, maybe new entrants wanting to contribute service to the community. And that has continued till now. And, and I think that uh, that has been a very good thing for Afrinic. And of course, we also observe in the case of Afrinic that the ability to make local policy uh, does affect the effectiveness of you know, the task at hand. So for example, we know that uh, at the, at, soon after accreditation, the type of membership we had begin to skew more towards the smaller size because majority of the operators were actually small operators and they were trying to fit into a large market, a large operator community environment when we were working with Ripe and Arin and so on. And that wasn't working so well. So by us changing the policy to recognize the size, the true size of our operators, we were able to increase the membership. And beyond that, we realized that allocation also, we changed the policy so that our allocation sizes were smaller than the normal that a person, a typical operator would get. So by knowing the community and making the policies, the community making the policy to suit itself, you're able to get a better match uh, to the needs of, of the community. And, and that has shown in the growth and uptake of uh, at least IPv4 uh, addresses uh, from Africa. Thank you.